It's February 24th, 2022. Russian forces cross the border into Ukraine. They're following orders from President Vladimir Putin. People here were packing up, trying to leave. A war unfolds that may fundamentally alter the global geopolitical order. Uh, Olaf Scholz, the German chancellor, uh, calls this Putin's war. He says the bloodshed must stop. European states are forced to react. This absolutely is a quantum leap for the European Union because they had to acknowledge that all their political doctrines, their ideologies and their beliefs throughout the last 10, maybe even 20 years were simply wrong. Deutsche Welle correspondents cover the war from day one. This is their account. Еще раз настойчиво подчеркну. February 24th, 2022 is a day that will go down in history as a turning point. In a televised speech shortly before 6 a.m. in Moscow, Russian President Vladimir Putin announces what he calls a special military operation in the eastern Donbas region of Ukraine. Whoever tries to interfere with us, and even more so to create threats for our country, People should know that Russia's response will be immediate and will lead you to such consequences that you have never experienced in your history. Just before I've been hearing once again sirens blaring, we have heard that quite often today, in fact for the very first time, Shortly after the first explosion hit here around 4 a.m. or shortly after Vladimir Putin declared, quote, a military operation against Ukraine. Now that military operation actually turns into a full scale invasion. Several rockets had hit various cities. Those cities under attack are not only in the Donbas region, but also in other areas. They include Kharkiv, Odessa and the capital, Kiev. An invasion by land, by air, by sea. That is what is happening right now in Ukraine. And people here in Kyiv, the ones who are staying, are hoping that uh, maybe what we have experienced this morning, the explosions, the shelling, that maybe this is it. But if you ask me, there have been so many things happening over the course of the past days that nobody thought is likely. Russian troops enter Ukraine from the east, north, and the south, from Russia, Belarus, and the Crimean Peninsula. They hit military targets and residential areas. Explosions are heard in many parts of the country, shellings and uh, reports of people being injured and killed. Now, the problem is we cannot verify this information. So I can only tell you, in fact, what I've been experiencing this morning. And that was a very, very critical situation. People here were packing up, trying to leave. Desperate people trying to flee the areas under attack. We've been trying all day since this morning, but as you can see here, it's unrealistic. There's lots of us, a dog, we can't fit, we're going back. You have to push through, but how are we supposed to do that with a child? They leave any way they can, away from the bombed cities, away from the advancing Russian troops. It's, in fact, almost impossible to go towards the West. So much traffic, traffic has built up. Again, there are also people who are just staying put and are trying to uh, inform themselves, actually, where is the nearest shelter when those sirens are going to uh, go off again. But while the terror is working, it soon becomes clear that Russia's assault is not going as planned. The attack on the ground stalls. This war is taking too long for the Russians. They expected a blitzkrieg that would be over in three days. But this is the second week already, 
or rather, it's been longer than two weeks. They haven't achieved great military success. The big cities are partly destroyed, but are not conquered, and the Ukrainians are of course playing for time. The longer the war lasts, the more weakened the Russian army becomes. Pictures uh, that we're seeing of tanks, Russian tanks, basically stranded on the on the street, meaning uh, possible, obviously, that they do run out of fuel, just like anyone else, by the way, right now. So it, the, the fact that we're seeing mostly rocket attacks on the city at the moment is an indication, I think, that um, a, a ground assault is proving more difficult um, wow. and is, is not perhaps likely in the immediate future. <sighs> The Russian army fires hundreds of rockets on Ukraine cities and people. Casualty numbers rise quickly. We spoke to military experts to identify what kind of attack was happening here, and they told us that this is most likely a cluster bomb. Now, the only other weapon it could have been uh, would have shown larger explosions closer to the surface of the building. Now, the problem with cluster bombs is that they indiscriminately uh, harm civilians and, and enact devastation, especially in urban settings such as this one. And so uh, when when war crimes investigators, when they start seeing the use of cluster bombs in a conflict, it, it usually signals a sign that, you know, there, there's quite possibly war crimes being committed here, and in this case, in Ukraine. After the shock caused by the heavy shelling of their cities, people get used to seeking shelter where they can. Um, I think most people here in Kiev have spent the night underground, either in cellars or air raid shelters. For people who don't have that, the only option is the metro, which is pretty deep. There have been some pretty heartbreaking images of whole families camped out on, you know, on kind of camping picnic blankets on the metro platforms trying to distract their kids. Just last night, the expectation was that there would be air raids around 3 a.m. local time. And then they didn't happen for most of the night. And just as the curfew ended at 7 a.m., suddenly there was a lot more activity and you could hear thuds in the background in the distance, even here underground. So it's basically this kind of sense of paralysis. And then you're constantly kind of looking at your phone, expecting some kind of warning and kind of paralyzed by that uh, inability to really understand what's going on. The attacks by the Russian military bring the horrors of war once more to Europe. They trigger an exodus to neighboring countries. Except the men. Men between 18 and 60 are not allowed to leave. They have to stay to potentially defend their country. It's very sad. It's very hard to let go of a loved one because you know that it's hard there, there is military action, and my father could die at any moment. People have left Kharkiv, but it is very difficult to get out of there under constant shelling and uh, the cap capacities are very limited of these trains. And so um, uh, the, the, there are quite a few places now where suffering is really, really big now. In an unexpected turnaround, many ordinary Ukrainians resist, some by blocking roads with their bodies, others by taking up arms. And I have to say that I was totally in awe to speak with uh, those soldiers who used to be just two weeks ago. Uh, they used to have just normal jobs uh, and now uh, they are ready to give their lives for their country. And, and I, I've been told by so many of them that they believe that Ukraine will prevail and they believe that 
the evil, evil as they call uh, Russia and Russian troops here in Ukraine, that they cannot defeat the will of the people to defend their country. So it's it's really impressive and 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 uh, almost so so difficult to come to terms how their lives have changed uh, over the course of the last week. That they have to they had to give up their their normal lives and they are now ready to protect their country. The Ukrainian parliament approved a draft law allowing all citizens to use weapons to fight the Russian attack. Russians can enter Kyiv, but they're not going to leave again. They're all going to burn here. This is one of the roads that lead directly into the territories that the Russian army is already occupying and the people here are preparing for an attack from that side. A tank can easily push away these concrete blocks, but these iron hedgehogs, as we call them, cannot be pushed away. We'll have to get out of their tank to clear the road. This will allow us to gain some time. That's what these things do. The Ukrainian resistance unfolds on different levels, on the streets and across all manner of social media. We've seen some pretty extraordinary images on social media of protests going on in spite of that Russian military occupation going on there. People coming out unarmed with flags, getting up on tanks, demanding the return of their elected officials. Leave. Think of your own children, of your mothers who must be crying. City bus just got hit by the rocket. Lives are getting lost. That's the war that Russia started. That's the city of Kiev. And many cities in Ukraine were destroyed. Lives were taken. That's the truth. This image is the truth of Russian war against Ukraine. President, President Zelensky appeared in a video on social media early this morning, basically trying to show I'm still here, I'm not going to lay down arms. There are people who want to resist, that want to fight, and this is something that President Zelensky also underlined in his appearances on social media, that everyone is really needed to fight the Russian troops. If you, respected European leaders, world leaders, leaders of the free world, if you do not help us today, if you do not give Ukraine real help, the war will knock on your door tomorrow. Glory to the Ukrainian armed forces, glory to Ukraine. The European Union and NATO are in the middle of drastically reshaping their policies military defense, energy independence, trade and geostrategy, almost all areas of international diplomacy are affected. We will invest more than 2% of our GDP in defense every year from now on. The German government really has done, uh, has performed a 180 degree turn on its policy. Uh, Olaf Scholz, the German chancellor, uh, calls this Putin's war. He says the bloodshed must stop and he says there can be no taboos anymore. This must be sanctioned, this must be punished. Now, of course, this is something uh, where Germany was late and many people still criticize that, but uh, this is also not just a Ukraine crisis, is the message here from the German government. This is potentially about defending something much bigger about European values. For the first time ever, the European Union will finance the purchase and delivery of weapons and other equipment to a country that is under attack. It's not just weapons. Western countries soon impose sanctions on Russia and consider taking another, bigger step. We have to get rid of Russian fossil fuels as soon as possible. It's, it's uh, 
very difficult situation that in one hand we have these financial sanctions that are very hard, but in the other hand we are supporting and actually financing Russia's war to purchasing oil, uh, gas uh, and other fossil fuels from Russia. So the situation is, isn't a very good one and we have to get rid of the fossil fuels coming from Russia as soon as possible. This absolutely is a quantum leap for the European Union because they had to acknowledge that all their political doctrines, their ideologies and their beliefs throughout the last 10, maybe even 20 years were simply wrong. Russia and the West are strongly bound by economic ties. Russia has long been a major provider of oil and gas to Europe, with some countries very heavily reliant on these imports, for private consumption as well as for the industrial sector. Europe, on the other hand, is one of the main suppliers of machinery, vehicles, and technology that Russia badly needs. Cutting these ties is seen as the best way to try to stop the war. Today, in light of Russia's reckless and dangerous military strike, we are imposing further severe sanctions. Today, in concert with our allies, we will agree a massive package of economic sanctions designed in time to hobble the Russian economy. Today, I'm announcing the United States is targeting the main artery of Russia's economy. We're banning all imports of Russian oil and gas and energy. That means Russian oil will no longer be acceptable at U.S. ports, and the American people will deal another powerful blow to Putin's war machine. The ban aims to weaken Russia's economy even more. Um, Rahila Biden said that they want to keep pressure on President Putin and um, his war machine. And uh, President Biden said that he doesn't want to subsidize this war. Um, the thing is, oil and gas exports are the backbone of Russia's economy. And the revenue of um, this business of gas and oil exports make half of the budget of the Kremlin. So this uh, should be painful for Russia, and it will have an impact, that's what they hope, on the money they need to keep this war ongoing. But while the U.S. bans Russian oil and gas, some European countries, like Germany and the Netherlands, hesitate. Their citizens and industries depend heavily on Russian fossil fuels. The sanctions hit ordinary Russians quickly, but some analysts doubt they'll be enough to force Vladimir Putin to stop the war in the short term. Let me say so that let me say that uh, in my view, uh, of course, people who are dealing with economic and financial issues uh, within the Russian government uh, uh, should uh, uh, assess uh, the implication of this military operation. Uh, they uh, should uh, have a clear understanding of uh, sanctions and what sanctions might mean for the Russian economy, uh, for the Russian uh, financial system. But uh, as we hear from. Uh, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, and uh, other leaders uh, in the Russian government, they argue that uh, sanctions are unavoidable, that uh, it really doesn't matter what Russia uh, can do or what it uh, will not do. Sanctions will be there uh, because uh, the, the West is uh, hostile to Russia and uh, it uh, wants uh, really Russia to disappear from the map of the world. Russians are badly hit by inflation and the freefall of the ruble. At the same time, security forces try to quash any form of protest. Thousands across the country risk publicly opposing the war in various different ways. I'm ready to drop on my knees before each Ukrainian soldier. Please forgive us. From my point of view, this war is inexplicable. And people are dying on each side, Russian and Ukrainian. We are people who used to live amicably, in peace and in harmony. Now we are separated. I don't understand this. Putin's government prohibits protests against the actions of the armed forces. 
It even bans using the word war for the invasion of Ukraine. Critical media and reporting are suppressed. But they can't stop everyone. I don't think uh, it's going to change. I think it's going to get harder and harder to get information. And even, you know, with this protest that we just saw, that poster that uh, the woman was holding up, um, various media outlets did report about that, but they actually had to blur her poster and they were only uh, allowed to say that she, um, you know, protested for pacifism, essentially because they're not allowed to use the word, word war. And, of course, her poster had the, the word war on it. The official line um, on this war is that it's a special operation where no civilians are being targeted. And, um, you know, I was saying it's going to get harder and harder. It already has gotten harder and harder to read any critical media outlets. Many have already been blocked within Russia. Many uh, critical journalists have had to leave the country. Facebook and Instagram have also been blocked. Getting independent information about Russian thinking is getting more difficult by the day. Russian opinion polls show a majority of Russians back their president and the war. If you look at the opinion polls, you'll find out that uh, uh, the majority of Russians uh, also support uh, actions uh, of uh, uh, the Kremlin in Ukraine because the belief is that uh, it's not a war against Ukraine. And if you talk to Russian people in Russia now, somebody still believes it's not a war, it's just military exercise. As Russian forces expand their devastation of Ukrainian cities, the war sparks the biggest refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. Here in Irpin, it's another attempt to organize a humanitarian corridor, temporary ceasefire to allow civilians to get out with their, their pets, their children, anything they can grab. You can definitely see our people getting across this destroyed bridge today, but there is fighting going on very close. So you can see just behind the bridge above those unfinished houses, plumes of smoke, that's a couple of months away. This is one of the places that had been fought about for days. People have been sitting there, trapped, waiting for an opportunity to get out. Women and children try to get to safety. Families are split apart. We left everything and just fled. I don't know whether we can ever come back. I think the situation that stayed with me the most was yesterday when we were right at the border where the men have to say goodbye to their wives because men right now they can't leave Ukraine if they're between 18 and 60 years old. We met Vladimir and this is what he told us. Now, you go? I will go some uh, bro probably territorial defense or something like that and we'll be preparing for the fight. Ukraine's western borders littered with heartbreak. At the crossings, volunteers await the fleeing Ukrainians and offer them a welcome and basic necessities. The children of Ukraine are fleeing war and are arriving here at this railway station near the border. They bring with them the trauma of upheaval, fear and sometimes wars. If there had been no war, our houses would have stood. My grandfather now sleeps with a gun. Sometimes there were sirens in the evening. The people hid all day in cellars and bunkers. The 
Beyond the human suffering in Ukraine and historic refugee flows into neighboring countries, the consequences of the war ripple further around the world. This is a crisis compounding on existing global crises. And we've already seen and started to feel the impact of this conflict um, on the wheat market. Prices have gone up to 40 to 50 percent in the last few days. Uh, I think countries that are dependent on wheat imports are uh, starting to scramble to find different ways to cover their needs. Um, some of these countries are extremely vulnerable. Yemen imports around 22% of their wheat from Ukraine. Uh, Lebanon, around half their wheat imports are coming is coming from Ukraine. Um, Libya, Egypt, Tunisia. So I think we will see a big impact on the economies of these countries. In a joint declaration, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank warned that lower-income countries will be hit the hardest by rising prices on global markets caused by the war. For Russia's economy, many experts paint a grim picture for the immediate future as well. The European Council President Charles Michel said that these sanctions would be massive and that they would be painful, and by all indications, they will be, because let's consider the effect and the impact that these sanctions will have on the ground. It is likely to be felt by ordinary Russians, ordinary Russians just trying to get by. Um, they will see prices of uh, goods around them going up. It is expected that inflation will rise in the country. Businesses, been small businesses in Russia might be impacted as the economy is expected to go into recession because of this. As the war continues, escalation into a wider conflict is still a threat. But NATO rejects Ukrainian calls for the alliance to do more by imposing a no-fly zone, for example. And so the Secretary General made clear, as he has on previous occasions, that this is just not going to happen. That, in fact, no NATO ally has an appetite to be engaged in a war with Russia, which is what would happen if it, if it needed to enforce a no-fly zone to close the airspace over Ukraine. At the same time, Russia is said to have asked China for military and financial aid, a warning that, on a global scale, the war in Ukraine could lead to the formation of new geopolitical block building a threat that the United States addressed immediately. The U.S. made um, uh, it very, very clear that uh, the Chinese are um, watched, really watched on how they um, behave themselves, what they do for Russia. If Russia is, and Russia apparently does, ask for military help and for economic help, um, I think the United States made clear that, and with a, let's say, use the term warning here that this is not in the best interest of China to do this because it would have um, really the uh, consequences not just for China from the U.S. but also from the European partners as well as other allies and partners from the U.S. around the world and their business with China. The war creates economic and geopolitical turbulence as well as humanitarian catastrophe. Nobody can say for sure where the world is heading after the Russian invasion of Ukraine.